It's Tuesday morning, January 18, 1977. News to Car 2. Go ahead. Steve, could you head out to Granville? We've got a report of a train derailed. We don't know much about it yet. If you could head out there straight away. OK, heading out there now. I'll call in once I get close. The first news of what is to become known as the Granville disaster. Yeah, it's uh, quarter past eight now. Um, there's been a bit of a problem at Granville uh, Station. Lloyd, wh what's the pr problem here? Well, uh, what we know so far is that a rail bridge, a train bridge at Granville has collapsed. We believe three people have been hurt. Uh, the police rescue squad are on the way. That's all we know at the moment. Steve Bland is in car two. He's going there now. One of those days, huh? It certainly is. And East Hills Line trains are still in a bit of a shambles too. That's right. Yes, Glenn. I'm on the air from home, mate. Do you storm me to go out to Granville? Yes, if you could. It looks like it's a big one. Uh, rescue squads are on the way. They're calling for oxygen. Apparently there's quite a few people injured. Apparently a, a bridge has fallen on the train. It's gone off the tracks. Uh, it's fallen onto a carriage, something to that effect. Um, so if you could head out there straight away. Steve's already on his way. OK. It's now 25 minutes past 8, 13 minutes since a Sydney-bound commuter train left the tracks near Granville Station and brought down a bridge. 2SM News is already piecing the story together. A reporter gets through to Granville Station. The train has overturned. How many people have been injured? Uh, we don't know yet. It's only happened about five minutes ago. Is it around the bend or something? Yeah, it's around the bend. And what's the scene now? Uh, ambulance and police have just arrived, but... Uh, just gone up. During 2SM's 8.30 report with Steve Liebman, a courier driver in a live telephone call yeah. gives the first detailed exactly description of the disaster the scene. scene. There at the moment. Oh, it's, uh, it's very sickening to be quite honest. The, uh, as, you, as you've already heard, the, uh, the uh, road bridge has completely collapsed on top. It's it crushed at least one and a half carriages. And uh, you can hear the people singing out from underneath, help, help, and you know, they just can't breathe. How many carriages have been crushed by the bridge? Well, I'd say uh, the end of one uh, plus one full carriage and the front of another one's completely crushed. Can you confirm that there were cars on the bridge when the collapse occurred? Well, there's, there's uh, a white Tirana. Newsman Steve Blander, the first radio reporter to reach the crash scene, immediately begins drawing together a composite picture of the rescue operation. A railway worker tells him... First one's down here, we were working up here when it happened, and uh, when we went down there, uh, the, with the section, we only hit that first section there, where the bridge has fallen right on top of it, and there was, uh, there was about half a dozen in the back section, they were all right, they were trapped, you know, with only minor damage, but all the seats had constantly back and trapped their legs and everything, and we got them out. Uh, then when the police and them started to arrive, we'd get, we started to look to the front section, and uh, there was a lot of dead from what you can see just where we were, and we got uh, five out that were just Looked like just had broken legs and a brain, you know, cuts and everything. Uh, I think all the rest are dead by it. Was there much panic around after it happened? No, not really panic. The rest, people on the rest of the train at the back were just sort of dumbfounded. They just stood, just stood on the edge of the, uh, just watching. You know, they didn't know what to do. I think. Uh, what was the first you knew of it? You were only working about a hundred yards up the track here. We were just up there, and. Uh, it's just a noise. You didn't have to... It's three it. hours after the train left the tracks. 2SM News is now running almost continuous reports from Granville. Heavy-duty mobile cranes are working flat out here at Granville Railway Station, removing tons of rubble, concrete and brick from an overhead bridge which has fallen on top of this very old wooden train, which was a long-distance train from the Blue Mountains down to Sydney, filled with commuters, and there was standing room only. So far, I've had varying reports of how many people have actually been rescued and taken to hospital. Those reports vary from about a dozen to as many as 40. At this stage, it's a very confused scene as far as numbers are concerned, but one thing is certain, under this concrete and rubble, there are quite a few bodies trapped in pancake-like carriages after these accidents. Uh, involved Members of the life. Sydney Rescue Squad work in impossible conditions as they struggle to free the dead, dying and injured from what's left of the carriage crushed by the falling bridge. The carriage has been completely flattened. All of the live persons have now been removed, or the ones we think are alive, we're pretty sure we know that we're alive. And uh, the problem now is we've got to get the concrete off the carriage and uh, have a look under and see what else we can find. Right, how many bodies are down there, do you know? Oh, I couldn't estimate. I wouldn't be able to estimate, but there's a lot, believe me. Right, what are the working conditions for the rescue squad guys down there like? Well, we've got porter gas leaking from the train, which is leaking up, which prohibits the use of power soaring equipment. Uh, it's hot. And it stinks, and uh, it's just, you know, 
nothing much you can say about it. It's just not the best working conditions at all. It's dirty. So we'll get there. 2SM now has two reporters, News Director Glenn Roach, three news cars and the Wales 2SM rescue helicopter at the disaster scene. It's four hours after the crash and a survivor tells Tony Bartlett... I started to move forward in the carriage and just at that stage the roof collapsed. Um, I was knocked to the ground by the roof because I was, I was just forward of where the bridge actually hit. Uh, uh, there were two women beside me who were sort of hunched up under the seat but they were OK. I asked them if they were OK and they said, yes, we're OK. You just hop out and you know, see if you can help. And what was the scene in the carriage? Well, there was no scene in the carriage because there was only one little uh, tiny part left. The rest of it was just crushed. Uh, the scene was outside. Really, when I got out, I had a look at the saw carriage one and there were people just still sitting in their seats. And there was just blood uh, on the seats and um, uh, it was just a terrible sight, you know. Were many people killed that you saw? Well, I did see some people who, who um, uh, were dead. Um, As the drama wore on into Tuesday afternoon, the police strength had swelled to several hundred. Inspector Ray Williams went through the crash train but still couldn't estimate the number of dead. It's uh, impossible, quite impossible. I've been through the wreckage myself with the rescue squad uh, several times and each time we come up with different nations. I'm afraid it will be rather high in ordinary terms. It will be disappointingly high. If there's two people killed it's wrong but there's quite a lot I think been killed down there. So it would be quite improper for me to estimate the numbers. I don't want to worry anybody unduly. As the disaster operation continues, 2SM reporters convey their impressions of the enormous task facing the rescuers. Heavy duty mobile cranes are working flat out here at Granville Railway Station, removing tons of rubble, concrete and brick from an overhead bridge which has fallen on top of this very old wooden train, which was a long distance train from the Blue Mountains down to Sydney, filled with commuters and there was standing room only. So far I've had varying reports of how many people have actually been rescued and taken to hospital. Those reports vary from about a dozen. One of the carriages has been crushed by a huge section of the bridge and a piece of masonry has fallen down through the forward section of the carriage. They're just attaching a, a big crane to a big lump of masonry that's fallen through the roof. I can see movement underneath but it's very dark down there and it's not very easy to see exactly what's happening. The masonry is just starting to lift up. Rescue workers are working in quite close proximity to it and they're putting themselves in quite a little bit of danger there too if anything should happen, if other pieces of brick should fall. There are workers inside the train right now trying to see if there are any people underneath it. There are teams of doctors and nurses down on the road. Seven hours after the first disaster report, five helicopters have been rushed to Granville. To assemble the helicopter. To assemble, this is the rescue helicopter. Helicopter, are you in the position to pick up Glenn Roach and take him over the disaster scene? Uh, we're just about to get airborne. If he comes out to the emergency helicopter now. Right, he's on the way. We're now circling above the plane, the twisted wreckage uh, of the three carriages sprout in a shocking, sickening mess. Uh, some of the big cranes immediately over it. I can see dozens and dozens of stretchers laid out on the railway tracks. Some of the cars that went off the bridge are spewed at crazy angles all over it. And the police, emergency, fire and ambulance units doing their best to bring the situation under control. The helicopter now heading for Parramatta Hospital will be touching down in a few seconds for more blood for accident victims of the Granville train disaster. As Tuesday afternoon drags on, the injured are still being released, eight hours after the accident happened. The young girl has been taken from the wreck of the train. She's just been brought out by the paramedics and she's being loaded on the Wales 2SM rescue helicopter. They're going to rush her straight to hospital where they have a, a large team of, of doctors and nurses standing by. Uh, the girl's leg is in the splint. We don't know how badly... It's ten hours since the train crashed. Station. Inspector Ray Williams. The situation now is that we've got one person to remove, one live person. He's been very brave and we think we're going to save his life. He's just down there. And this big crane is going to uh, hopefully lift the girder off him and we can get him away. Beyond that, I'm afraid, everybody is dead. The last injured man to be freed is 32-year-old Brian Gordon. He was trapped by the legs for more than 10 hours. As he's carried to a waiting helicopter, reporter Tony Bartlett describes the scene. The helicopter which will take him directly to hospital where an attempt will be made to save his legs with microsurgery. However, due to the extent of his injuries, they're not all that hopeful. What condition is he in now? Uh, he's uh, There was mention before that uh, they were...
will be needing microsurgery techniques at the hospital to try and repair his legs. Uh, that's possible, that's possible, yes. We've uh, arranged for surgeons to be standing by. The injured man died later in hospital. As the dead are pulled from the train, they are taken to the city morgue. Steve Blander. I'm now uh, at Camperdown and I've been speaking to one of the attendants on the gates here. He's told me that quite a few victims from the train disaster have been brought in. He's not allowed to tell us how many, which uh, will be confirmed later on, of course. Inside the building, uh, they have dozens of social workers who can speak uh, many different languages for the migrants who may be inquiring about their relatives. And uh, police have been put on duty around the building here to make sure that only close relatives do get in to inquire about uh, victims of the disaster today, and, and not just uh, friends or anybody else that happens to walk in, otherwise uh, there'd be chaos if uh, there isn't already. So it's a pretty busy scene at the city morgue here at Camperdown at the moment. It's the end of day one, January 18. A lot of people have stories to tell about today. One of them is a local priest, Father McGovern, who was one of the first people to reach the scene of Australia's worst rail disaster. It, it was fairly, fairly quiet, except for one woman who seemed to be in great pain. She, I couldn't see her, but she was calling out for the weight to be taken offer. Uh, in other cases there was just a, a, an arm you know, uh, uh, protruding to anoint. Um, a, a couple uh, of people, one a, a blonde lady, um, uh, you could see the whole of her body but she was difficult to get at. I was only able to anoint the, the top of her head. The rescue operation continues throughout the night. It's Wednesday morning. As the sun comes up, Steve Blander is next to the crushed carriage. Rescue workers sifting through one particular carriage, the one which was under the bridge as it came down with the tons of cement, steel girders and bricks. The roadway piece by piece is still being pulled away by these huge mobile cranes on the scene. People being told to move back because they're hindering operations and just looking around in a circle around me, a sea of faces. It seems as if everybody within a two mile radius who was at home has come here and stayed for what they think is a, a great day out for the whole family. And unfortunately they're hindering operations quite a lot here today. Looking up I can see ambulance men with stretchers uh, on the crane, lowering them down. And, the rescue squad teams have now been working non-stop for 20 hours. Their leader, Sergeant Joe Beecroft. Actually there is a um, large number of bodies there and uh, they are crushed into a very small and confined space. It's impossible to say just how many is there. I wouldn't even make a mad guess of it. By Wednesday morning, the full impact of the disaster becomes clear. Superintendent George Marshall tells 2SM... The death uh, count at the moment is uh, 57 positive. Uh, we still think that there are uh, perhaps another 10 or so bodies in the wreckage. It's now midday, Wednesday, January 19, 1977. 28 hours after the accident happened. 12 o'clock report and this is Brian White. At least 60 people have been killed in the rail disaster at Granville, which is the worst train smash in Australian history. The train was the 609 from Mount Victoria, due at Central at 8.32, but around about quarter past eight, it ploughed into a pylon of the road bridge over the tracks at Granville Station. Steve Blander on the scene, you can take up the story. Well, Brian, the estimates of the death toll do go as high as 60 or 70, but frankly the police don't know any... Uh, definite figure at this stage because there are still people trapped in some of these carriages as they're working right now. And looking down at that wreckage, the 60 or 70 toll doesn't seem to be an exaggeration. There are splinters of wood scattered along the whole track where the 609 for some reason jumped the rails and as you said ploughed into the overhead bridge. The train was packed at the time and there was standing room only, I was told, by rail workers who saw it pass them about 10 seconds before the accident happened. The first carriage had its roof sliced off about window level, so I don't give much... At half past two on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, the final police briefing is held. All of the dead and injured have now been accounted for. The situation at the moment is that we've removed all the concrete and the girders from the crushed carriage. Uh, at the moment we have 67 uh, being removed from the wreckage. Uh, I say that there are another probably 10 bodies yet to be removed. Of the 67, do you know how many were uh, men, how many women and how many children? Uh, no, I haven't segregated them at this stage, but uh, approximately half and half and half. How many children, sir? 
Uh, there was only one child that I know of definitely, and that body was removed uh, just uh, last evening. Three o'clock, Wednesday afternoon, and the emergency is almost over. Glenn Roach is still on the scene with the final tragic details. Yes, Terry, and tragic they are. We've been told uh, a few moments ago by a senior police officer they have 67 bodies in the morgue. There are another 10 bodies uh, next to what's left of the carriage, making 77, and they believe there's another two bodies on the other side of the train still being handled by medical officers. Uh, it appears to be a sum total of 79 dead from yesterday morning's shocking rail crash here at Granville. As you said, the massive rescue operation is almost... One of the last of the rescue squad to come up from the wreck of the train is Sergeant Joe Beecroft. After 32 hours of non-stop work, the heartbreak finally gets to the sergeant as he talks to Peter Hazelwood. Emotionally, whilst you're working, it's OK. But I'm afraid once you stop, and particularly when you're asked about it, as you can probably see. And it was at this point that Sergeant Beecroft, uh, a veteran of many rescues, broke down. It's now five o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, 32 hours since news director Glenn Roach reached the disaster scene. Is there anything else that's worth saying at this point of time? Uh, only I think if we start off uh, rather end with what I started off with uh, I certainly don't want to see it again and I know that no one in Australia would, would like to see or, or even like to contemplate that there could be a disaster like this again. As the operation finally started to wind During down, the long hours at the crash scene, the 2SM news team had an extra job as they covered the story to find out what had happened to a girl named Jill. We finally found out, and news commentator Brian White explained. If there's been any extra compassion in the coverage we've been giving the Granville disaster, it's been because all of us here at 2SM have been waiting in fear of a personal loss. When I started to work here in May last year, one of the first people I came to know and like was a girl called Jill. She was tall, slim, very pretty, and with a quiet and gentle nature, the sort of shy person who never got uptight but was always friendly and helpful. For. Seven months ago, Jill married a young man named John Clayton and they moved into a home at Woodford in the Blue Mountains. It was from there yesterday morning that Jill set out and caught the train which had left Mount Victoria at 6.09. Two fellow workers usually join her on that train, but yesterday one was on holidays and the other had come down earlier. All day and night long, our reporters on the scene tried to find her. But by nightfall, her name had not turned up on any of the lists of injured, and all her husband's inquiries and ours convinced us, even if we did cling to last hopes, that she was one of those caught in the horrible toll. Now the casualty list shows that Jill Clayton is dead, and all of us here are stricken by it. The Granville disaster was the biggest story ever covered by 2SM News. For the first time, because a full-scale emergency operation was needed in Australia's largest city. The last words on the disaster were left to men in churches across Sydney. For many, the shock thus sustained will always remain.